10,000 is the supposed number of hours it takes to sculpt a scholar. From childlike, clumsy, raw curiosity to practice applied deliberately. Until the coveted title then includes expert, virtuoso, doyen. What an achievement that protege can then boast. A professional, a professional adult now that's better than most. It will take years and so much more. Endless suffering in pursuit of galore. A sallow-skinned perfectionist, socially awkward, talkative at best. Only at ease when his or her mind is fixated, obsessed, or occupied, wheels turning constantly in motion, quelling the threat of unbridled emotion. Strums of a guitar that communicate better where words feel like teeth pulled by the letter. Feelings that teach torches to burn bright, explained in brushstrokes painted just right. Retribution for cruel mediocrity felt, good enough, at least for the moment. Purpose reassured, reason justified of why you're here and why you're alive. Fueled not by night oil, money, or love. Rather, perhaps, it was the lack thereof. In any kind of way, shape, or form, the search for perfection inside was born. The question that tends to fervently reside in hours spent with therapists and bartenders is why? What happened to make you work harder, better, and faster? What did it take to make you a master? Thank you. So I want to first thank all of you for joining us today. Um, this session, we're going to be discussing something that's a little bit of an existential topic, which is the making of a master. An interesting topic itself because it uh, connects with the definition of and the origins of genius and talent and creativity. And on our panel, we have three individuals who are masters in their field. First, we have Mr. Philippe Dufour, a master horologist who some have called a living legend. Merci. Hello. <laughs> we have uh, Chef Inu Ozzy. Uh, he is a master in the field of cuisine. Ah, Chef Ezu. No, I, I'll get it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> master in the field of cuisine. He's established a number of successful restaurants here in Dubai, including La Petite Maison. And Mr. Michael Clarizo, he's a renowned historian and a master wordsmith, and he contributes to a number of publications, including the uh, Wall Street Journal magazine, WSJ Life. So I want to start um, by reading a quote from Schopenhauer, which I think relates to this topic. Talent is like the marksman who hits a target, which others cannot reach. Genius is like the marksman who hits a target, which others cannot see. And so I think what is interesting when we're talking about this uh, issue of making of a master, is the three gentlemen on this panel all have hit targets that most of us haven't seen before. So when you talk about prodigies and masters, there's all sorts of debates about nature versus nurture, environment, but I think one of the first foremost factors is childhood. So let's start at the beginning. So Mr. DeFore, I want to start with you. Tell us a little bit about your background. You grew up in Switzerland, the, the child of watchmakers. Tell us a little bit about that and how you think it, it formed your craft. Okay, I try to be really short. <laughs> uh, I started uh, watchmaking the, at the age of 15. I was, uh, at that time, I was no good at school, and my, my parents told me, you have to choose for a profession. And I'm living in the Valley de Joux, where the choice is very narrow. And I was just good enough to be a watchmaker. So I didn't choose my profession. But since the beginning, the first months, you, make, uh, you start to make your own tools. You take a piece of material, you drill, you file, you mile, 
and you create something from a piece of, 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 of steel or brass, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you start to make your, your, your own watch, you know, the school watch during the three first years, okay? It's how I started. Then after uh, many, many uh, different experiences around the world, first at Jägerkul, then uh, in England, in Germany, I worked also two years in the U.S. Virgin Islands assembling uh, watches, and uh, I came back in Switzerland during the watch crisis, we call it, and um, I did some other experiences, different brands, and I couldn't stand the, the, the factories anymore. So in one day I became independent, and during five years I restore watches, mostly complicated pocket watches for uh, ocean people. It's how I start, I start to discover a new, new world, and it's where I took all, all my inspiration. I have a question. You, you sort of grew up rooted in the Swiss tradition, but you were a watchmaker for a time in the Virgin Islands. Yeah. yeah. How did that shape your thinking about watchmaking and the kind of watchmaker well, you've become? All the experiences I, I, I had abroad uh, show me, explain me that we have to stop in Switzerland to think we are the only one uh, to make uh, watches, you know? And I realized at that time that uh, watchmaking is universal. You can, you can, and I was uh, in a factory in the Virgin Islands, 120 people. We used to produce 1,000 movement per week in the Swiss criteria with people uh, born under palm tree, you know? And uh, uh, it was a, 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 the opposite that I've told, uh, somebody told me, because in my country, you know, to be a watchmaker, you, three generations you need, okay? You, you have to be uh, born under a pantry, okay? And if you sing to the uh, men's core in, in the village, it's even better, you know? All that is, is rubbish, you know? So that it's, opens your world. What, watchmaking, you can do anywhere in the world. Okay, and Chef Izu, did I get it right? Yes. <laughs> okay. You were born in Nigeria. You've lived in London, Paris, Spain, and now Dubai. You didn't come from a food background, correct? What sort of was the spark for you? Um, uh, there's three versions, actually. The, 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 give us the, the version. The clean version, the Catholic <laughs> no, version, the and thing. the other version. <laughs> but anyway, no, but basically, I started uh, cooking uh, more out of... Uh, um, when I saw my mother enjoy the things I made, uh, because she, she basically raised four boys alone. And she, she basically worked uh, three or four jobs just to keep food on the table. And seeing her work hard to achieve the goals of just feeding her boys also uh, lit something in me, because uh, you, always, uh, you always, uh, take examples from people around you, uh, and that's what spurred me on. I mean, I, there's no fairy tale that I dreamt to be a chef and I want to be a Gordon Ramsay or be whatever, whoever there is, out, the persona out there. It was more uh, out of the, the love that my mother showed in the way she, 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 she strived. She, she had a mental attitude where uh, she can achieve anything she wants if you put your mind to it. And she installed that in me. We grew up, I grew up in a very poor neighborhood in London, Tottenham, where you, you can either become that way, or you could uh, fight against uh, the society we grew up, which was quite impoverished, uh, and dream bigger. And she, she saw that in me about dreaming bigger, and only your mental attitude will get you where you need to be. And, and, and she always said, uh, I mean, she always uh, said to me uh, that if you want to achieve something, there was a pain to be given. Uh, and that is what I've always uh, installed in my head. But seeing her happy, the first time I bought something home, that, that was a, a big motivator, that, that, I mean, and, and then made me want to do more, give her, give her more. So the pleasure I took from her being happy the, uh, was the motivator for me going on, pushing on, and um, starting the career of being a chef. And when did you know you had the talent to do this, not just that it was a, a, a pleasure? I mean, I, to be honest, I, I, I disagree with when people say, hey, I've got talent for this, I've got, I, I, I dreamt and I, and I became, the, no, no. I, I'm a great believer that uh, everybody in this world is born with 10% talent. And then 90% is the effort that you put to exploit that 10% into being a bigger percentage of who you are. Uh, and, and it's the determination. And uh, you have to find uh, 
the, the, the passion or the love or the, the, what makes you happy. Because I, I don't look around me to, uh, to direct where I want to go. I am quite focused on the direction I have, and that's making other people happy. And what I say to my, my chefs nowadays is not, we don't do food. We do happiness. People come to sit in our, in our table, in our restaurant, to take a joy in that moment of friends and all that. And we, we, we're an instrumental part to that joy that we give others. So uh, when, sh when chefs take product and look at it as a product, not looking at depth, they lose the whole insight of what, what they're doing. They, they, it's more like I was speaking to my gentleman here, uh, how he describes different cultures and how they look at food. I mean, the French is all about the, the perfection, the, the, the contriving of it. But uh, to, for me, because I lived in that culture, and I, I love the culture of the Japanese, the way they respect everything around them. It's about who they are, the respect for people and the, and the things uh, which is in, entailed in the whole of the ecosystem. So it's how you look at things that brings out the joy that you're, you're looking to share with others. Okay. And Michael. Um, if you haven't had the opportunity, you should definitely read Michael's work. He's beautiful prose. But what I find interesting is you said in your background, your father was a gambler. So tell us how that impacted you, or, or did it not? And my father being a gambler. Well, the great thing about my father, and I realized this quite early in his life, is he lived by his wits. All my friends, their fathers got up and went to work in an office every day. My father didn't do that. And as I said, I learned very early he lived by his wits. And he was incredibly intelligent, and he was a brilliant mathematician. He was so smart, I thought he should have worked for NASA. And not only was he very good at what he did, but what he did was illegal. <laughs> so those two things, the way they influenced me, was first of all, I like living by my wits which you do as a freelance writer, which is essentially what I am. And he, he taught me to have a very healthy disrespect for authority. Okay. Because, of course, he was forever bribing police to leave him alone. And that influenced me. I haven't bribed any policemen, please. But there's still time. I, I, don't, want, at least <laughs> until now, I don't want to say anything that could get me arrested. <laughs> but that healthy disrespect for authority Okay. which is something you'll see in the other two gentlemen on the stage as well. Philippe, I know, has a very healthy respect for a lot of watch-making authority in Switzerland, and Chef is the way he has described what he does. He doesn't do food, he does happiness. That's a disrespect for authority that brings you to a different place. So that's the way my father influenced me. Okay. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, given that you were George Daniels' biographer, I, I think it would be interesting. I'd, I'd like to get your perspective. It's much has been known that he had a very difficult childhood and a particularly difficult relationship with his father. In your opinion, how did this shape his genius and his craftsmanship? The thing about George and his childhood is it was very difficult. Both his parents were abusive. And he discovered mechanics at a very early age, about five or six. And at first, he didn't know what to do with that discovery, because there was no one to tell him. Philippe has said he comes from the valley, where if you want to be a watchmaker, there's lots of people who tell you how to do it. Philippe wouldn't listen to any of them, and he would do it his own <laughs> way. And Chef had his mother to, to encourage him and teach him how to cook. George had none of that. So there were great gaps between when he discovered mechanics, when he prized open a clock at about the age of five, and when he got to work in mechanics. But the important thing is that when he shifted to working in mechanics, he discovered a world that was peaceful, that was harmonious, and that he could control. The world outside the watches or clocks or the gramophones or the bicycles he fixed when he was very young. He could not control it. It was violent. It was chaotic. But that mechanical world, he controlled. And it was peaceful, harmonious, and it gave him a great peace. And he could contemplate, and he could go on to invent all the things he invented. But as Dominique pointed out, it took him a number of hours 
to do that. He would go without sleep for four or five days and do nothing but work on his watches. And he could do that. And that's incredible. So you've brought up a few things that I want to get to. And one is it the, the idea of adversity and its role in shaping genius or creativity. And you've all mentioned it in a certain, to a certain extent. Um, so this is open to any of you. What would you say was a particular challenge that you had to, in your journey to where you are now, um, overcome? How, how has adversity played a part in, in your craftsmanship? Yeah, it, I think since the beginning it has been a, a long fight. Uh, first, to stay independent. That was uh, my, my target because if you, if, if, if you leave some people uh, bringing money in your atelier, uh, you are a dead man, okay? So I always fight to be uh, in, independent. It was not easy. And I, I will just uh, uh, explain that, what, what I explained to the, to, to the young generation, you know? Sometimes young watchmaker come into my workshop and they dream and say, oh, I would love to have that, that, that. I say, yeah, you can have it. But first you have to take your time. It's not easy. But before starting, you have to erase three words of your vocabulary. Weekend, holidays, and retirement. And then you can start, okay? The, the, the road is very, is very long, believe me. Did you want to add to that? You had mentioned something yeah. in your beginning statement about how you grew up in, in poverty. Would, was that something that you would say shaped where you are today? It is. And how? And I, well, what Philippe said is a perfect example. It's about the, you have to be ready to give up certain parts of your life to, to, for any success that you're willing to have. And you can't just dream it and, and hope that it's just going to come down. So you, you, you're going to get a lot of people that are not going to support you. You're going to get people, you're going to get supporters. You're going to get uh, your family and everything, friends. <coughs> so you have to be quite focused in, 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 in your journey where you're going to where you want to be. And yes, it shaped me because growing up in poverty, you appreciate the simple things in life. And, uh, and, and you understand more because you look into detail. But it has to be first. Uh, you, have to, you have to speak to yourself a lot. You have to ask yourself a lot of questions that a lot of people want to ask you. And so I cycle a lot. And I use that moment to, to reflect on who I, who I am. and, and, and What's my purpose? And all these things are also uh, it's, it's a, it's something that you need to know to be able to communicate to other people. Mm -hmm. What I do in my craft is it's, uh, it's something which brings a lot of pleasure to a lot of people. So I use a philosophy because a philosophy is a way that guides the direction I want to go. Uh, it's not, as I said before, it's not just about taking an ingredient, chopping it up, and just creating something. Like the Italians, the food looks not much, but it tastes <laughs> fantastic. The French looks one, voila, and all that. And you taste it, you go, where's the flavor gone? And I always say to people, people do not come and sit in your table to eat your ego. They come to eat simple, tasty food. And that's where the whole industry, I mean, it's like a lot of kids will, will look at Gordon Ramsay or look at uh, Nusret or look at whoever around as a role model and say, I want to be like them. But they forget there's a lot of stages and, and uh, learning to be done. Everybody wants to get to the top, but they don't want to take the steps slowly and give up a lot of things. There's a lot of things that you have to say, OK, I'll leave that on the side. I have to now learn my craft. Okay. I'm, I'm curious. Um, you had said you think talent's only about 10%. You talked about the many, many hours. When, when one talks about masters or genius, there's this debate about uh, innate talent and then the external factors. So, you know, there are talented children that are prodigies. Not all of them evolve and develop into a master. So in your opinion, given your own experiences and the experiences of others, you know, how much is it talent and how much of it is discipline and you have to put in the hard work? What are the sparks, what are the factors that differentiate a, talent, a talented person into really a genius or a master? I mean, there's something that I use in my head all the time. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, discipline is real freedom. Because it, well, how do I, what do I mean by that? We all have the wants. I see a chocolate bar, I see this, I, I, I want to eat it. And you eat it. But then 
the, the adverse effect. You, you, you gain more weight than you should. But that's the thing. Want is within everybody. But when you understand how to discipline and say no to things and say yes to things and, and understand the things around you, you become free. You become free to choose. So when you come to talent, we all are born with talent. We're, we're winners. At the end of the day, each one of us here in this world are winners. But at the end of the day, it's up to each one to determine how much they want to ex ex expand that talent. I'll give you a, a great example. Ronaldo and Messi, this is a beautiful uh, dialogue that everyone has. Messi is a naturally talented person. Ronaldo, he has that talent, but he developed that talent even more by his, his strictness in his work. Work ethic. A work ethic. And that's what has given him that, uh, that platform where he is now. It's the same for everybody. We all have that ability to extract more from that 10%. But it's, up, it's your willingness. It's your mind. Your mind sets your goals. Your mind sets your limit. And I hate that word, can't. I'm one of these persons, when someone comes and asks me something, I'll tell them what I can do. I won't tell them what I can't do. Because what I can't do doesn't, is no use to them. So it's about how you, you process everything. Tell people what you can do. Don't tell them what you can't do. Michael, where do you come down on this? I'm sure you have an interesting opinion between you know, innate talent and uh, the hard work or the combination thereof. Well, <clears throat> I'm of the opinion that we all have innate talent. And the people who excel in the world are the people who work at developing it. And I'm very suspicious of this idea of genius. And I think one of the worst things that's ever happened in the history of humanity <laughs> is the development of the IQ test. You, know, you have all these people running around saying, I have a genius IQ. Mm -hmm. OK, but what have you done? <laughs> Nothing. Well, there is no genius mm -hmm. but the work of genius. Mm -hmm. We think Michelangelo was, was a genius, and he was, because of the Sistine Chapel ceiling not because he ran around 15th century Florence saying, I'm smart, I'm smart. Well, this, you, you kind of le lead me to a question I was curious about. This definition of genius today, it's liberally used. Kanye West self-describes himself as a genius. I'm not sure that counts if you self-describe. Um, what is the criteria for genius? And in a contemporary, in the world we're living in, who would you, who would you put out as a, as a genius? Well, another thing I don't like. And, uh, Sorry. No, I'll, uh, I, no, finish, but I, want, no. I would love to hear from Another all of you. Another thing I don't like about the idea of genius is it's basically a social construct. And all the geniuses in the world are dead white people, <laughs> dead white guys. Men, yes. Yes, dead white guys. <laughs> <laughs> really? I love that. <laughs> and, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Is, are, are, is that a shout for the dead white men, or? <laughs> <laughs> I think you should say what it, it was thinking. <laughs> I wasn't clear. <laughs> no, seriously, OK. Everyone considers Mozart a genius. Mm. But wait a minute. Mozart was born into a musical family. He was born at a time and at a place where music was the supreme art. And so he developed in it very quickly. I'm not saying I love Mozart. I do love Mozart. He's a wonderful guy. But <laughs> his, and his music is very precise. Now, there's another musician that no one ever calls a genius. But his music is just as precise. And it affects people in the same way. And that's Chuck Berry. Mm. Now, Chuck Berry is a dead black guy, so no one ever calls him a genius. But he was. And he saw things could be done with music that no one had ever done. He saw ways to reach out to a large part of the audience that had neglected his type of music. So yes, and I think particularly with the precision that he got into his work, it's just like the precision Mozart got mm -hmm. into his. So they're very similar people. Another example, and this is a living white woman, yeah. Donnie Part Dolly Parton. <laughs> Dolly Parton is absolutely one of the supreme musical talents of the 20th century and into the 21st, because everybody likes her music. And she did things with her music that no one had done before. She reached a whole different audience. She got stories into her songs that bring people to tears. That, uh, no one, very rarely had that been done before. You know, and outside of opera, sure, opera can bring people to mm -hmm. tears. But so can Dolly Parton. So I'm very suspicious of genius. I think it's all around us. 
it's just how hard you work that makes the difference. I just want to add a quick one to Please. that. Uh, just relating to when I was growing up, basically I wasn't very academic, actually I was the worst one at school. I was put in a corner because uh, I, uh, I was more interested in the female kind than anything else. Um, but at the end of the day, I was stig stigmatized or put in a box, put in a certain, because I wasn't, I wasn't up to the expectation academically. And, and I remember that we had sets, we had, uh, one set, two, uh, so you, you feel like you're worthless, because mm. you're, I was in bottom set for everything, it was like, wasn't even a, a discussion. Is it, yeah, third one, yep, yeah, okay. Uh, but all the people in the, f the first set, that were the genius, uh, or uh, like prostitutes and all that, I, 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 I haven't followed any of my school friends, but I know most of them, the ones on the top set, I go back there in the Tesco checkout. I, I saw one of them there, and this was a genius. At the end of the day, I, I, I like to be very humble in, in anything I do, but yeah. that also shows to you, I was at the bottom set, and he was at the top set. But I also want to point out to this thing about um, how we basically stamp that genius stamp on mm -hmm. people or things. Uh, I always say, Art is very subjective. Everything is art in, in every way. It's how you look at it. The beauty you see is not the beauty he sees or the beauty I see. It's the same as food. The, the, the thing I eat, I might enjoy it. You might say, mm, not my palate. Or like wine, someone says, mm, voila, do, 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 do you taste this? And you look at it, I don't taste nothing. I just, I just like it, actually. I'm just, I'm like that. And that's why I say to people, stop listening to other people's mm -hmm. perception of what they believe. Listen to what you, if you like it, yeah. drink it. I mean, you can't, you don't need to share it with them, you can just drink it yourself. And that's why I say to people, art is subjective in every way. We call him genius, but I, like Chuck Berry. I, I mean, there was one time, I had a, one of my baker teachers, uh, he's in Paris. He, he basically said to me, uh, he jokes a lot, but he said to me, why isn't there no black philosophers? Then, but there is, but, but nobody knows of them. And that's the thing, that's a strange thing. So everybody has their own perception of, yes. of talent and everything. And that's where we, ha we can't now listen to, because everyone will tr try to force their opinion on you. It's like you go to a restaurant, they say, oh, that restaurant's fantastic. You go there, you take a, it's, okay, it must be, I can't disagree with anybody. It's, it's fantastic, but it's- The group shit. think. Exactly. Mm. So I think everyone has to define what the art or the beauty they see. Don't let other people define it for you. And, and to your point about what you were saying about school, I guess the lesson there is don't peak in high school. <laughs> My mother wasn't very pleased, actually. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when we talk about these factors, external versus internal, I think two interesting factors, and I want to address this one to you, is that, and to your point about Mozart, is the period that you grew up in and the geography where you grew up. So I wonder... Do you think you would be doing what you do, you would be where you are if you grew up in a different time period or different geography? Yeah, different geography for sure, yeah. Because I think what I'm doing, I can do it ju just in my place. I mean, the, the, the geographic, the climate, everything, the season, the quietness. I, I could never do what I do in, a, in town, for example. Hmm. Yeah. Does that apply to you, the geography and... If you grew up in another era or a different place, do you think you would be doing something entirely different? I mean, what, how important are those two factors in, in shaping you? I, I, I agree to a certain extent. I, I mean, I'm married to a French woman. I got to understand the French culture. I always say to my wife, I appreciate the French culture more than you do because she was given it. I had to learn it. Anything you learn, there's a certain value you put towards it because you worked for that. So the thing is, uh, I had to go and find out all the different kind of cuisines. English in England is not known for its gastronomy. It's like fish and chips and uh, <laughs> vinegar and, and all that, HP. So basically, if I stayed in that culture, I would be a different direction or dif different way of thinking. I, I was born in one culture, so it got me curious anyway. I was a curious person from day one. I always like to take things apart. But that's what I always say to everybody. We're all born being curious. It's like you're a baby, you're calling, you find something, you put it in your mouth to find out what it is. 
But we forget that when we get older, we become more cynical, we look at things more objectively, we, we don't take that, uh, the, uh, that leap of faith or trying to think, find new ideas, because doing that, we discover who we eventually can become. And that's where, for me, I was born in Nigeria, grew up in London where, I mean, I, got, I went there, my mother went for a two weeks holiday, and 20 years later, I got a British passport. Not, don't blame her for that. But, <laughs> but at the end of the day, she took a risk. And that's what sometimes in different cultures instills you have to take a risk. You have to go out in the wilderness and the jungle and basically find food. Don't, don't stay back. Because if you're fed very well, of course you don't want to go and find food. You, it's there. And that's where environment does play a part to who, what potential you can have. So what I think is interesting, even though the three of you are in, operate in different spheres, one common thread is that you've all lived or spent a great deal of time in other countries and cultures. So I'm curious about how you see that as an impact or an influence, but I'm curious, particularly, I understand that you spent six months in a van traveling across the United States, yeah, is that yeah, correct, with yeah, your wife? Yeah. How did that shape you? What kind of impression did that make on you? Yeah, I discovered uh, a, a new world. I mean, uh, and- What year was a, this? A it's me. What year was this? What, what, he, what we, year did you uh, travel? In? 70s. The 70s? Three. Yes. The spaces. And we used to go through a major town mm -hmm. and national park. So I did uh, most of the national park instead. And it was, for me, it was a discovery, uh, extraordinary. The wildlife, the Sequoia National Park, uh, Grand Canyon, Zanik Canyon, all these canyons, uh, the marvelous. And the space, I discovered space, you know. What would you say is the bigger influence or motivator in your work, in your life? Is it success or failure? Uh, I would say they're pretty equal because you only learn from your mistakes. And your mistakes can be a huge motivator. Success can sometimes be an inhibitor because you're basking in the glory of whatever you've done. And speaking as a writer, you're only as good as your last sentence, but you better get on and write the next one. Yeah. I, I use the same philosophy, actually, because I always say to people, you win the race or you're the best restaurant today, but people don't care. They want next day, they want it even better or the same. So I, I agree with that success and failure. It's like, a, I don't know, it's, like a, it's like a gambling. When you win, oh, yes, I can win again, I can win again. And, and at the end of the day, you have that, 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 that mm, yeah, you're going to try. But also, it depends how you structure your mindset in the sense that when you fall, how do you get up again? Because at the end of the day, I, I, I've had, I mean, I started with La Petite Maison here, but then things went horribly wrong, and uh, the success gave me failure in, in a sense. But also gave me success in a sense because I got myself up. I didn't dwell on the past. I now. Eight, nine years later, I've got a restaurant which is better than a Petit Maison, uh, which is Gaia. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, fans. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I paid them. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the thing is, uh, if you dwell on, on, on the negative, it will eat you within. And that's where, I mean, Winston Churchill is, is a great uh, philosopher in his own, in his own right. He said the uh, more you fail, the more you succeed, because it's getting up again and trying again, having the courage to keep trying. And that's why I keep saying, even to my chefs, at the end of making a mistake is great. Make it, but don't, make sure you don't <laughs> waste the truffle anyway. But uh, it's all about uh, learning. And to learn, you have to fall. It's impossible not to have. That, that experience and the success, it's both together. It's a balance. Now you have to balance it in your mind in how you think. What about you? What has been a bigger motivator, success or failure? Well, uh, fortunately for me, success didn't come too early. Mm. Okay? I, I started making my first watches in, in 92, so it took years and years. And uh, uh, Today, it's, it's a little bit of recognition, but it's always, uh, uh, it motivates me to, to go even further, you know? That's when you can always improve. And what is marvelous about watchmaking is no end. 
Mm. You know, you can always try to be better and better and better until my last day. There's a comment that I always like to use. Success is always under construction. Yeah. <laughs> never finished. Exactly. It's All never right. finished. Yeah. So that's where I use my, in my head. I, I said, yes, you've done it well, but you can do better. And that, and that is self-driven. And that's why I said 90% is you, is how you motivate that 10% to become even better. So even though the, all of you are at sort of the peak of your, your field, you're saying you, there's still more to learn, that, that you're, it, you, yeah. Have it, yeah. you can be at the top, but yeah. there's no end in sight. There's no, yeah. I learn every day. Exactly. Yes, you know, especially watchmaking, it's a, it's a word like that, you know, and very often I learn by, by making mistakes, you know. Yeah. So better to know what you don't know, <laughs> to live that but way? Also, that's another motivator, the curiosity. Yeah. You know, yeah. Learning is, an, exactly. is wanting to learn, wanting to have more yeah. information taken mm -hmm. more, is an enormous motivator. And that's why I always say, stay a kid, because yeah. little child always have eyes, oh, they, they're curious about every single thing. Uh, as I said before, they put things in their mouth to find, discover what it is. And that's where I think as we grow up, we forget that child-minded feeling of being free to discover. And discovery changes who we can become, and then also we we'll share that with others. It's, it's another thing I say: when you're on the, when you when you when you do succeed, reach down to bring others up with you, and that's, that that also will keep pushing you up. So it's never stop. So when each of you were young and you were starting and you were just sort of beginning to come into that, this might be the field that you would um, end up becoming a master in. Um, were you, I mean, there are some studies that say sort of the difference between a prodigy and a master is that the person was, their talent was identified when they were young, that's one point, but they were encouraged and supported and nurtured in that talent as they moved on. Was that your experience? That once you, you, you or someone outside identified you a talent in cuisine, in writing, in watchmaking, or was it, other factors where you, the support wasn't there? I mean, it depends on the individual. I had, a, uh, I had loads of uh, mentors. One of them, uh, I remember it like yesterday, Jacques Chibois, uh, who, uh, who lived in uh, south of France. He taught me how to analyze flavors and how to bring them all to, to play with each other so you can, uh, you can mm -hmm. taste it and, and have that experience. Mm -hmm. uh, he, but he, what I, I mean, he took time to teach me about that, teach me how to use fat. Fats it. People think, ah, it's the enemy. No, it's a referee, actually. It brings all the different par parties to play together so you can enjoy it. I, but the thing is, the way he taught me is because I work like seven days a week, uh, uh, six months without no days off, and he saw the eagerness, and he, I gave something for him to take time to teach me. The, the, people will teach you, but you have to give them a reason. You have to show them that you're ready for that uh, knowledge to be transferred. And that nobody will transfer their knowledge cheaply. Not, I, I'm a great believer that everything's an exchange factor. Yeah, you go to the shop, you want, you want something from the shop, you have to give money. You know, as simple as that. You want a relationship, you have to give your time. Everything's an exchange policy in life. Okay, so, for my, yes. For, for myself, I would say, I didn't have any mentor. And I've been facing the lack of of uh, knowledge, watchmaking knowledge, because the watch industry uh, had a big crisis during the 70s, uh, what we call the quartz crisis, when all the factory threw out everybody, the watchmakers, the tooling, and the machinery, okay? And when I started uh, independent, you know, I bought for, for nothing this, some old machine. But the use, the guide, was not with the machine, you know? So I had to reinvent how to use this or this machine, you know, because the knowledge to use this machine, all this knowledge is in symmetry, symmetry, you know. Uh, it, has, it has been a lack of transmission of know-how, and I've been, uh, it was difficult for me. I had uh, nobody to go to, uh, can you explain me how to use that or that? So that was a motivator for you, I mean, you had to, go out and find this on your own. Yeah, exactly, but uh, not easy sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure I had an external force pushing me into writing. 
my parents both would read aloud to us when we were children, and that affected me greatly. How so? Uh, sorry? How so? How so? Uh, I fell in love with words because I thought they were beautiful. And I think a perfect sentence, of which there are very few, is a beautiful thing. Certainly, I've only written like one, I think. And that was a huge motivator, wanting to be able to reproduce that beauty that I experienced in reading and in writing. That was a gigantic motivator. And also, there's a certain pleasure in doing that. There's a, there's a satisfaction about it. And I think today, the motivator, because I don't consider myself a master. I'm not there yet. I'm far too young <laughs> to be considered a master. You sure? Uh, another 10, 20 years and maybe <laughs> okay. just start edging into that category. But uh, there's something I go through every morning which motivates me, <clears throat> and that is I think of the dictionaries, and I have dictionaries very next, very close to me where I work, and I think of the dictionary as a box of puzzle pieces. And you know when you used to put together puzzles when you were a kid, you turned over the box and all the pieces came out? Well, that's what the dictionaries are to me. Mm. And every morning I turn them upside down in my mind, and all the words fall out, mm. and I think I have to put that together in such a way that everyone understands it. I mean, uh, there's something I, I, I like. I, I love the way you explain that, actually. Words are beautiful. Um, but it's like I, I, I was listening to somebody a, a while back talking about singing. I mean, singing, I mean, you think it comes from the vocal cord. It's not. It's coming from within. It's you, you, how you feel. And then that is translated. Words are the same thing. It's how you feel that, that basically, you, it's like in France as well. You can, uh, they, they have the vu and the tu, which is a uh, polite and then the formal and, uh, and the people that you know. But you can be very polite by using uh, tu, which is the informal. Or you can be very rude using vu. So it depends how, the, how you feel that transform, transforms the words so people to understand. So there's a lot of things that, I mean, that, that can motivate you. It's how you feel uh, that, that, that drags that out. It's like, for me, food, it motivates me to make other people happy. I, I love the philosophy, the Japanese, the Asian culture. Food is a medicine. And they, and, and they, and they treat it, they, they, they touch it with the same respect uh, as a medicine. So that's where it motivates me. I, I don't want anybody to come to my restaurant to have a bad meal. That's my motive. I, 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 to go out not smiling, not being happy. There was an experience I had in Monaco where one guest came with a daughter who was very sick. But basically, yeah, yeah, she was anorexic, but he only told me that the, 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 the next day. And he told me, I transformed the vision of food for her. The way I, I, I because I, I was bringing food and taste, and he saw cream, he goes, oh no, she's gonna hate it, but she just dug in there. I kind of gave food a different perspective for her. Food wasn't an enemy anymore, it was like a friend. Mm -hmm. Because the way I, I, I put it, because I wanted to please them, I wanted them to be happy. I didn't want them to leave and not be happy. And he told me that, and I had to tell it to the kitchen, because the kitchen don't see that, what they do behind the scenes. And that's where you have to have a philosophy, how you work, to be able to transmit what you feel. Okay. Yeah. Um, that thing you did with the girl who's anorexic, mm -hmm. that is an act of genius. Because you did something with her no one even believed was possible. <laughs> and that is an act of genius. And I must say, Philippe's grand and petite sonnery, <laughs> so an act of genius. OK. We have just a couple of minutes, so I have a couple of questions I want. The same question for all of you. Uh, the first is, if you were to give your younger self advice when you were just starting out, what would it be? Yeah, I told you before, the first the words you have to raise from your vocabulary and uh, try to, to realize your dream because uh, in watchmaking still so much to do. And if you take inspiration from what was done before us, uh, yes, it's, it's plenty to do. Your life will be full of, uh, yes, new creativity, yeah. 
Uh, well, my younger self, as I still consider myself very young, <laughs> uh, I think my one word of advice to my younger self would be work harder. That's it. Uh, I'm going to steal this one. Somebody said uh, to, uh, I, 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 I I'll just use one letter to say more F. Uh, <laughs> because the, the, the expression of who you are has to come from you. Because we all live in a world of politically correctness, and a world challenging the, 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 the laws and everything. You can never discover something living in a box. Uh, and, and everybody wants to put you in a box, because I was described not long ago, I was a very difficult character. And I, and I, I own that shit. I, I, I love that. Because at the end of the day, whenever you're doing something different, you're changing something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where you have to tell yourself to, to, to be a bit more self-imposing. And be, don't let other people uh, distract you what you believe. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's you that, that has to explain to others. Nobody's going to understand if you do not force other people to listen. Whether they accept it or not, it's up to them. But at least try. And last question, we have one minute. Um, how do you want history to remember your work? Oh, I don't know. Well? <laughs> well. <laughs> Kindly? <laughs> I think, uh, yes, what, what I did will, uh, will stay after me, for sure. I know some uh, some happy people around the world can wear one of my of my watch, and I feel very proud and happy about that. Okay. I'm sorry, Stacy, I didn't quite hear you. How do you want history to remember your work? I think history. Wow. I'd like people simply to still enjoy reading what I've written. Um, I don't want them to remember me. I actually know. I want them to. I what I want before I go. I want to trans transmit that to the next generation, so they carry on living that. Uh, because uh, sometimes someone said the, the richest people are in the grave with the knowledge and everything. I don't want to be in the grave with the, the knowledge I have. I want to transmit it to others. So. I mean, I have great sh young chefs which are now leading some of the restaurants, and, and that makes me happy, just to see them grow. So hopefully they keep making people happy, and that's the simple thing I want. Okay. Well, with that, I want to say thank you for hitting the marks that the rest of us don't see. And um, now question time, if anyone has questions. A hundred years ago, this question would have been irrelevant because everybody knew how you made a master. You started out an apprentice, you became a journeyman, and then once you were good at your job, you made your masterpiece, you presented it to the guild, and if they liked it, they made you a master. Do you wish there was still a formal structure in the craft that you're in? Well, there is no formal structure in the craft I'm in, and I don't think there ever has been, James. Certainly, there is for watchmaking, there is for cooking, there was a formal structure. So with writing, it's not that way. You find your own path. The, your, your masters are the people you read and you try to learn from. But I somewhat disapprove of creative writing courses because they create the illusion that you have been an apprentice and when you graduate, you are a master. I don't think it's that simple. And a lot of creative writing majors go on to be marketing managers, things <laughs> like that. So I don't approve of that kind of structure for writing. After all, Shakespeare didn't have a master. Mm. I w An I MFA. I would answer <laughs> about, the, about the much making. I don't call myself a master. I'm just a watchmaker. Because in Switzerland, we have a title, master, but you have to follow a, a special course in a, in, a, in a watchmaking school in Solothurn or Grenchen, uh, but it's more specialized for a watchmaker who will own a, a, a watch shop. Okay, so I'm just a simple watchmaker. I mean, structure is always good.
but uh, as you see, the, 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 the culinary scene changes year and year and year. Uh, before we had the, the French, they, they were the, yeah, the best cuisine in the world. And over time, the Spanish came with the El Bulli and all this uh, 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 monocular structure food, this deconstructed uh, uh, Greek salad. Dish. And I'm sure next uh, there will be someone else who's going to come up with something crazy. I mean, when people create cups without no handles, I, I scratch my head, why? <laughs> the cup's hot. I want handles with it. But they, they think it's genius by doing that. Uh, and, and that's where I kind of want to always uh, push back on, on, on the new generation when they start uh, making things because it's, it simply says something different instead of looking at the practicality of it. Uh, we have a structure in, in, in industry. You go to, uh, you learn the theories of this and then, and it's up to the individual to, to deep inside to understand what they're going to ex It's like you go to school, you learn all year about how to do something, but you're not going to take the textbook into the exam because it's meant to, you're meant to tell people what you've learned, and that's what cooking is. You, you get taught, then now you have to tell people how you feel about what you've been taught, from your own words, not, not scripted. I have one question to uh, Mr. Philippe Dufour. Uh, some independent watchmakers remain always independent. However, they transmit their knowledge and their passion to the next generation so that the legacy continues. Is this something you're doing, or uh, this is something that will end, hopefully, long years to come with you? Yes, it's what I'm, uh, I'm doing. Uh, during my, this last, uh, I would say, 15 years, I had some uh, young watchmaker working with me. You know, they come and they stay and they go. And uh, two, for example, uh, are teaching watchmaking now. Uh, I have... Uh, uh, a daughter, my fourth daughter, she is uh, in the third year school, uh, watchmaking school. It's a four year study, so uh, probably she will come to work with me. So together we can carry what I've started. Hello, I have a question for the panel of how to deal with repeatability and perfectionism. Uh, Chef Izu, if you know how to improve a specific dish, but your audience wants the same dish they had before. Mr. Dufour, you are creating the simplicity, but you have an idea of how to improve it. Would you get it into the series, or would you produce the same watch as everybody else before bought it? Will you get this advancement that you have in your mind, because you've, you have found a way of making it better, or will it bother you so much that you have to do something inferior while you know you can do better? How do you deal with that? No, I don't have... So the question is, if you know how to make simplicity better, yeah, you will the always... next watch be different from yes. the one before? You can always improve. Okay. Yeah, it's no end. <laughs> okay, thank you. I mean, I, I always get this every time. People say, oh, when are you going to change the menu? When are you going to change the menu? And uh, you listen, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, get, I, I take feedback. And when I do change the menu, do you know what? They always order the same thing they ordered before. And I said, why do you want me to change your menu if you want to do it? At the end of the day, it's how people, it's one day they'll come. The, the thing is, our industry is a personality. Everybody's different. Everybody has uh, their, their own way of looking at things. Uh, I mean, I, I want to catch more to Philippe because for me, I'm a big fan of watches because of, of how intricate and how precise but how beautiful it is to get things in mo to work in tandem, to work to give us an expression, and, and, and for me, that's, I, I, I marvel at that, and that's why I'm a big fan of watches. Uh, they are expensive, but still, at the end of the day, I, I, I don't look at it as expensive, I look at it as a value, because we know the cost of things, but the value we put in it exceeds whatever we pay for it, because you appreciate the beauty. And so for me, it's not a, I, I say that, but it's ne never expensive. It's, it's a, I, I appreciate the, the, the skill and, and, and the, the, the way it has to be thinking to make this, I can't even imagine it. So for me, the beauty of that. So when a, anybody comes into my restaurant and says, change this, change that, I listen, but also filter to understand. But I, know, I, I, can, I know when something is not right. I feel when they make a comment that this is, needs a bit more tweaking, 
and I felt it already, it just heightens it for me. And, I, and I'm always working, never stopped in, in developing new ideas or developing the same recipe. But also sometimes in, uh, leaving alone the dish is also in itself perfection. I always want to improve <laughs> and improve what I work on. So that's the way I look at it. You three create three very different things. Um, one is a writer, one is a watchmaker, one is a chef. Um, when creating, where do you typically start? And the last thing that you created, where did you start with this? Um, for watchmaking, was it a feeling? Was it a sound? For um, culinary, was it a taste? Was it an emotion? For writing, was it a word? Um, really curious to hear where you guys get your start from with the things that you create. Um, for me, words have meaning, sound, colors, sometimes smells. They have all those things. And I try to get all of that into my work. That's what, that's what I try to do. I mean, for me, I have, uh, recipes are the, I always say to people, don't copy recipes. Recipes are done by the person himself. So how you feel is transmitted in how you treat the ingredients. I always say to people, Talk to the ingredients, talk to your tomato, and people think, oh, he's a, he's a nutter, he's really you know, lost it. But to talk to an ingredient, which is, a, is, a, is alive, is a, is a living, uh, uh, basic entity, talking to it, it will talk back to you. And then from having that conversation, how do, I, how do I explain that? Like, take a tomato for an example. What is a tomato? Where is it from? Uh, I mean, and the tomato will say to me, Izu, I'm juicy, I'm, I'm sweet, <laughs> be delicate with me, sharpen your knife before you cut me because you, you get all the juices inside and sort of splatting everywhere with a blood knife. That's what he tells me. And he tells, don't put me in the fridge. I'm, I don't like the fridge, oh, no, no. Keep me outside so I can be more, more vibrant. It's exactly that. You, so you treat that tomato with, that, with the words he's using. So I won't put it in the fridge because as soon as you put it in the fridge, sugar, because it is a fruit, it, it conducts moisture, so in the fridge it has moisture. So it will take the moisture from the fridge and dilute the flavors. And then you get a tomato, it doesn't taste like tomato. That's as simple as that. And then I create a dish because I understood the ingredient. And that's it. The, the, the idea is always a bit selfish. I wanted to make a freehand watch which fits myself, okay? And fortunately it pleased some, many people, okay? And uh, always I try to, um, take inspiration from what was done before me in my era called Valet de Joux, where they were very high-grade high watches. And uh, um, in every uh, uh, watches I, ma I made, uh, every calibers I made, uh, it's, uh, it's a part of this, uh, I would say, signature, Valet de Joux signature. Sincere thanks for coming and sharing your views. It's really been fantastic to listen to all of you. Uh, we talked earlier about balancing success and failure and how that motivates. I was curious if you could say how much, if at all, self-doubt or insecurity contributes to your path. Um, the doubt is your friend because if the doubt is deep enough, it will propel you to fight it and to overcome it but it never actually goes away. Because if you had no doubts, you wouldn't ever be confronted by the challenge of creating something because the doubt makes you want to do it because you want to dispel the doubt. But it comes right back, which is very good because it moves you on to the next one. So I'm a, a fan of doubt. And it also makes you think. I completely agree with what he, you said there. Because in, in my industry, you know how it is. I, I, everybody, everybody is, excuse my language, but everyone has a, a rear end. It's, it's, it's like an opinion. Everyone has an opinion. And they will tell you their opinion. Uh, whether you appreciate it or not, their, their opinion is their opinion. And you're, you're taken on board. And that also brings into you, are you good enough? Ask, ask the question. And the doubt 
is it can go two ways. You can use it to conceal you, or you can use it to motivate you, to fill the fire in, in making it better, proving them wrong. But uh, it's something that uh, I agree is like when I go recycling, I'm always in pain, but I've made pain my friend because he's, he's basically giving me a, a different level, extending my capability. And the doubt is the same thing. I've made it my friend. I'm always doubting, am I ever good enough? When I do a new concept, would it work? And in my head, I always just say, no, I am good enough, but I'm going to have to fight that doubt and, and, and work, and it keeps me awake. And that's why I say to people, never, never sleep, never get comfortable. You know, always be uncomfortable, because being uncomfortable means you're asleep, and the doubt keeps me awake. I would say when you do something new, uh, the doubt is here. Okay, you, know, you know, never know until uh, it, it's done, uh, the way the, the, the new product will be received by, by the watch lover, for example. It's, uh, in the doubt, it's, uh, it's always here. I feel personally that chefs will, will forever see master chefs. When you pass on, there'll be someone after you. Same thing with watchmaking. Michael, you're a writer and you know, a journalist, I think, as well. You do research. In this day and age, in the day and age of biased news, advertorial, you know, fake media, when I think of a master journalist, I think Edward R. Murrow. I think Walter Cronkite. Do you think in our field we'll see masters of journalism anymore in the future? Yes, we will. <clears throat> and I will tell you why. It's something a very great man said, Abraham Lincoln. You can fool all of the people some of the time and some of the people all of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. <laughs> Human beings are much smarter and much more individualistic, much less of a herd animal than many people believe. There will always be masters. The mic. They'll always sprout up. They'll always pop out of the ooze. That is this nonsense that's going on around us. So yes, the new Edward R. Murrow is somewhere out there. Or we should have said Barbara Walters, because you know, we don't want to just talk about dead white guys. <laughs> I'm actually, I think, one quick question for everyone on the panel, including Stacey. Uh, what books are you reading right now? What's on your reading list? And uh, what would you recommend for someone who is also p pursuing a career in your uh, field? I'm reading Bad Blood by John Carreyou. I brought it on the plane with me. He is the Wall Street Journal reporter who broke, I don't know if you're familiar with the Theranos scandal um, and won the Pulitzer Prize for it. That's what I'm currently reading. Um, but I always suggest read just the best books, the best writing, and the classics. I, I always go back to the classics. Um, and I have a hard time with fiction, but I think that's just because the world I live in, but I, I tend to gravitate mostly to nonfiction. But that's me. A anybody else? What you're reading? Michael, what are you reading? Uh, I'm doing a lot of research right now, so I'm reading books about the subject I'm working on. And when you do a lot of research, you have to go back and read books, maybe that were written over 100 years ago, because you need to know how a story evolved. So that's what I'm doing now. Actually, what I'm doing is very similar, but my research is literally every single word that I, I, I mean, I, I, I believe everything is connected. I mean, fiction, uh, uh, reality, whatever it is, everything's connected because fiction becomes reality at, a, at the end of the day because somebody who's writing it has thought about it and someone's going to make it. Uh, and I mean, I, I, I will give you an example and I'll use this example to everybody. Uh, how many people know the makeup of the air we breathe? What do we breathe? Everyone will tell you oxygen. But it's, no, we don't breathe oxygen, we breathe nitrogen. 75% nitrogen and 23% uh, oxygen and then the other gases. And people say, why do you need to know that? I breathe it, I use it, I should know it. Uh, so that's where, how simple of my research, I, I, or I Google something that I, I have, I've heard, I, I wanna know it. 
I'm that curious that every single time that I, I want to understand what's around me. It's not just about cooking it, but everything around me. So, but then, when I understand that oxygen is, is what make, breaks up the nitrogen, because too much nitrogen will die, burn the lung, where does the oxygen come from? Oh, it comes from plants, trees. Oh, wow. A again, so if I go out, in a, uh, go out in a club, I won't be using the, 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 the tree as a, as a toilet. I would, I would be more respectful, uh, because I mean, it gives me life. And it, all these things are connected. And that's why, that's why I always say to everybody, don't just focus on your field. Use other fields to, to relate to what you do. It, it expands your knowledge, expands how you can approach your own field in a different perspective. And with that, I thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>